Good morning. Welcome to Adam Square. We're going to start with hymn number 392, please. 392, Who is on the Lord's Side? My faith has found a resting place. My faith has found a resting place, not in device nor grief. I trust the ever living one. His wounds for me shall plead. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Enough for me that Jesus says this ends my fear and doubt. A sinful soul, I come to him, he'll never cast me out. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that 
that Jesus died and that he died for me. My great physician heals the sick, the lost he came to save. For me his precious blood he shed, for me his life he gave. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Okay, last hymn for the morning is 419, please, moment by moment. Father, we are gathered here to bask in the glory of your word once again, but you know that we don't bask in the glory of your word enough when we step outside these doors. It is incredible how much we are edified and our lives are enhanced and beautified and made cleaner by immersing ourselves in the cleansing waters of your word on a daily basis. So let us always be inspired to open this book, not just on Sunday, but every day, whenever we have a chance. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, good morning. Welcome to Adam Square Baptist Church. This morning, we are glad that everybody is here. Thanks for you that are joining online. We thank you. If it's 
our first time here today, we would encourage you to fill out a visitor card on the back welcome table, drop it in the offering box so we can further get to know you, try to be a blessing to you. And then as usual, we have the Food and Fellowship right after service today. Right after service, just through this door, right after service is Food and Fellowship, so anybody's more than welcome to feel free to come and be a blessing and, and, and be a blessing too. And then also, just an update right here, it says Adam Square Baptist Church, we need your help. It says a dedicated crew or if you were able to conquer the detailing of the classrooms last week, our next step in the preparation for the fall is painting. We will be spackling, sand, sanding, and painting this week, and we could use some more hands. The church will be open 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. for those who can join us. And anybody that is available and willing, please reach out to Pastor and Rachel for that. And then on Tuesdays, we have the ABCs of Christian Growth taught in Spanish by Miss Angie in the back. She teaches it to Spanish-speaking women Tuesday nights at 6 p.m. Meet here at the church. And then the ABCs of Christian Growth will start back up in the fall. And then Brother Sean, he just mentioned to me this morning, the U.S. citizenship class is going to be postponed until the fall. So if you guys know anybody interested in that, it's going to be postponed until the fall. See Brother Sean for that. Teen night tonight, every, um, every Sunday night, teens gather for a time of games, food, and devotions. And that's from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. on Sunday nights. And then bus ministry, we have a van that we pick up every Sunday morning and Wednesday night. So if anybody needs a ride to church, please let me know. We would love to be a blessing and to be able to bring somebody to church. Parking reminder, just to park down the street, free up some spaces for first time visitors and for handicapped and the elderly, we ask that. And then at this time, we're gonna take up our Sunday morning offering. We could have a couple gentlemen, please. Why don't you go ahead and pray for us, please?
Good morning. Not this Thursday, but next Thursday, Thursday, the 28th of July, uh, we could use a few volunteers to help out with the women's group that we have here at the church to, for child care. So not this Thursday, but next Thursday, it's the 28th. So if you could help out, that'd be a blessing. Uh, please see my wife or please see Kathy if she's here today uh, and let them know that you could show up. That'd be great. Uh, it's a good time. We're watching this ministry kind of take off and uh, we're watching young women come in with uh, some kids who need some help, need some assistance, and we're able to help guide them to a closer relationship uh, with God. And so we're thankful for that. Um, I'm thankful for all that the Lord is doing here at Adam Square Baptist Church. We are coming up on our 133rd anniversary, 133rd anniversary. How many of you were here when the church started? 133rd anniversary, and uh, interestingly enough, we just got a letter on Friday from a, from a woman, uh, an elderly woman, who is a member here, uh, I want to say 60 years ago, 50 years ago. She's now living in, uh, in Michigan, uh, and she sent us a cookbook. That cookbook, a church had a cookbook, uh, and so we're taking a look at that. Maybe we'll make copies for our anniversary and hand it out to those people who like to cook. Uh, but she sent, a, she sent an article from the church's 100th anniversary, 100th anniversary, uh, and there was a little bit of, little bit of facts that I kind of want to give you here this morning because uh, it goes along with my message. Uh, how many of you uh, remember what I preached last Sunday morning? How many of you just remember the topic of what I preached on? What's the topic? Th say the topic. It's being a servant. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Being a servant. And uh, we're going to continue that again this morning about being a servant. Uh, so I find it very interesting that I preached last Sunday about being a servant. Uh, in the letter we get this week from a lady from 70 years ago, 60 years ago at this church. Uh, and she said in, in 19, 1920, 1920, how many of you remember 1920? Nobody here, right? Uh, 1920, the Young Women's Ministry, they call it the, the Willing Women's Servant Ministry. That's what they call it. They were willing, they were women, and they were servants. But that was their, that was their total, their title, Willing Women's Servants. Uh, in 1920, they, they donated the church bell. How many of you know we have a bell in the bell tower? We have a bell in the bell tower. Right now, it's not working. Uh, there's a huge crack in it, and so we need to get that repaired. Uh, but in order to get that repaired, you've got to take it out of the building, down to the ground, and have it repaired. And I don't see too many bell repair companies uh, on the corner street anymore. So there's a huge process in getting that. So we just put a, a device there so you can't, you can't ring it so it doesn't break anymore. Uh, but they donated that in uh, 1920 to this church. Another interesting fact, how many of you like the, the, the church that we're looking at? You like the church we're looking at? How many of you like to guess that in, in, 1900, in 1900, when they built this church, this church right here, it's 120 years old, uh, this church over here, uh, these four walls, when you go over here, are uh, the four original walls of the church, and it used to sit on Lincoln Street. It used to sit right there on Lincoln Street. They picked up, they walked it back to where it is today, and they rotated it 90 degrees, and they set it down. Uh, and so that, that was in that information. But how much do you think this church right here, this church right here, how much do you think this church cost to build in 1900. Anybody want to take a guess? 20 grand. 20 grand, you are way too high. Uh, if you were playing The Price is Right, you would not be the grand prize winner. It, it was $12,000 $12, to build this building 120 years ago. All right? That's what it cost to repair a baptistry three months ago. Right? Not kidding, not kidding. Uh, and so obviously things have changed, but uh, what was interesting is that we started to see in this letter the people who donated, the people who gave, the people who offered, the people who were servants, the people who stepped up and said, this is my church, I belong here, I want to be here, and I want to give to the church. Uh, and so uh, I thought it was very interesting that the Lord brings me to being a servant, uh, and this week we get a letter about people being servants a uh, hundred years ago, and here we are today, we have a choice to make. We have a choice. We can be servants like the generations of Christians who sat in these pews uh, before you, like our Savior, or we can be a casual Christian and not really do anything for the Lord. Uh, but I would you know, venture to guess this morning that we would all desire to be servants for God. And so my question, my, the title of the message this morning is, what does God want from you? What does God want from you? You ever wonder what does God want from me? 
You know, he puts you through trials and tribulations. He asks you to do things. Uh, and sometimes you, you do these things, you're like, God, what are you doing? I, I know I have that uh, conversation with God quite often. Lord, what are you doing? I don't get it. I don't understand. I don't know why. I don't, I don't comprehend. I don't know where this is going to go. I don't know why you didn't go this way when I wanted to go that way. Uh, I don't know what's going on sometimes. How many of you realize that's the way God works? Uh, and so when we say, what does God want for me? I think that's really uh, a question that God can answer, and he has answered. So let's travel through scripture this morning and see how God has something for us. What does God want for me? Well, turn with me, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter number 10. Deuteronomy chapter number 10. And we'll be skipping through the Bible this morning. Deuteronomy chapter number 10. Verse number 12. Deuteronomy chapter number 10, verse number 12. And now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee? What does he want? What does God want? What does God require? What is he looking for? But to fear, to fear the Lord, to fear the Lord. So what does God want? He wants you to fear him. But notice what it says, to fear thy God. It doesn't say fear a God. It doesn't say to fear some random God. And we know threaded through the scripture. Tyron was preaching a little bit this morning. And I was in uh, 1 Kings and 2 Kings in my own uh, d- daily reading this morning. And, and uh, there was a lot of false gods. There was a lot of little A gods. And I was thinking about, uh, I read the story of Elijah this morning. How Elijah called all the prophets of Baal and said, uh, you take the bullock and I'll take another bullock. And you take the wood and chop up the wood. And, and whoever's God calls upon the fire to come down and burnt up the offering. We know that God is real. And so uh, the reason why I love Elijah, because I think Elijah was one of the original trolls in the Bible. I don't know if it's right to call him a troll, but he totally was trolling. He totally was mocking. He totally was laughing at. Uh, and if he was God's man, then I kind of think that maybe it could be okay sometimes to troll the enemy. And so he, he calls these prophets and he says, okay, uh, you cause the fire to come down. And if that's your God, he'll cause the fire to come down. And so uh, they, they go from morning to noontime. Uh, and he comes back at noontime and he starts laughing at him and says, where's your God? Maybe he's on a journey. Maybe he's sleeping. Maybe he's walking away. Maybe he's too busy. Maybe he's not here yet. Maybe you should do something else. And so then they get on pile and they start cutting themselves. And they start bleeding all over the altar. And he looks at him and he just starts laughing at him again and totally mocking them and making fun of them. And then he says, "Okay, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to take my bull, my 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 oxen, and I'm going to I'm going to you know my my cattle. I'm going to cut its head off and I'm going to put the body parts all right there. I'm going to dig a trench all around. And then oh yeah, go get some water." put the water on it, and then put some more water, and then put some more water, and then so much water it filled the trench, and then he said, God, basically, God, you do what you're going to do, and show them that you're real, and boom, the fire comes down and lights it on fire. That's our God, right? And I'm thankful that there's that, that kind of tenacity that we can see in the Bible. I'm thankful that, that he had such a reverence and respect for God that he can call upon the Lord and he feared the Lord and said, Lord, I know you can do this. And I think as we continue to go through the, the word of God, as we continue to grow, I think what we need to understand is that God still wants us to fear him today. The fear isn't like a, a lightning bolt. You, you put your head down. I wonder if God's going to strike me dead. But the fear is a reverence. The fear is a respect for God. And what we're seeing today in this day and age is a lack of respect for each other. Uh, And I'm talking inside the church and sometimes more often outside the church. A lack of respect for for others, a lack of respect for our neighbors, a lack of respect for other people. Um, We just took a a quick airplane ride down to Florida for a couple of days, two, three days. Uh, And on the the way back, it was probably one of the worst planes ride I've been on. Uh, there was a bunch of families sitting behind us, and instead of their kids uh, playing on their devices nice and quiet, they let their kids jack up the devices to the loudest possible noise they possibly could do. I'm surprised they didn't have a Bluetooth speaker amplifying the devices, and the kids were kicking the chair in front of you, kicking the chair, stepping up, and when they get up, they, they grab your seat and they roll it back so they can get out, and you're just like, dude, do you not understand like, what it's like to be civil? You don't understand what it's like to be cordial, to be, you know, to be respectful. And it's just, you, we have lost the respect and reverence for God, and therefore it's going to trickle down and lose the respect and reverence for the society in which we're living in. What does he say? He says, to walk, to, but, but to fear the Lord thy, thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him and to serve the Lord with God, to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul. 
You see several times in that verse, thy God, thy God, thy heart, thy soul. What does that mean? It means it's making it personal. So what does God want? God literally wants you to fear him, to love him, to walk in his way, but more importantly, he wants you to serve him. So how do, you, how do you serve him? You say, Lord, whatever you want me to do, I'm willing to do. Here I am. Choose me. Here I am. Send me. Here I am. I will do whatever you want me to do. But that, that service heart comes from, obviously, our Savior. We talked about that last week, and we're going we're gonna to get there a little bit. But I want you to look with me, if you would, to the book of Psalms, Psalms chapter number 2, Psalms chapter number 2, or Psalm 2, verse number 1, excuse me, verse number 11, Psalm 2, verse 11, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling, rejoice with trembling. When you look at that word trembling, you, can, you, can, uh, you understand that, that God is looking for you and I to have that, that holy reverence. And when we look at the world around us and we see how God is going to judge them and we see how God does judge them, look at verse number 9. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces in a potter's vessel. What is, what is that? that? That's our God saying, look, I am going to annihilate the enemy. But then he says this, verse 10, Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. So what are we, what are we looking for? That if, we, if we're going to serve God, we should do it with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind. We should walk according to the way God wants us to walk. And when we serve him, we should serve him with a, with a gladness. We should rejoice. We should get excited that we get to serve God. Amen? <laughs> We should get excited that we get to serve God. Yeah. You, you realize that we are in the freest country in the world and you have the ability to serve God without anybody telling you what to do. If you don't like the preaching, guess what? You don't have to stay. You can get out and go to another church across town, across the city, 15 minutes away, 30 minutes away, 3 hours away. You can go to a different place. But you realize there's other places around this world where you're forced to go to a church or forced to go to a mosque or forced to go to a, a temple that you may not agree with. And that's just part of life, and you have to go because that's what's going on. We have that freedom. And so we should rejoice that we have that freedom, but also rejoice with what? With trembling. What does that mean? That, that we are literally in, in awe at what God can do and what he does to our enemies and what God does for us. Look what it says in, in Hebrews chapter number 12. Hebrews chapter number 12. Hebrews chapter number 12, verse number 28. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, let us have grace. Who's this in reference to? It's obviously in reference to believers. So look what it says again. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. What is that kingdom? That kingdom is heaven, right? Cannot be moved, let us have grace. So when you and I accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we have the best amount of grace we're ever going to get in our entire life. That grace is we deserve to die and go to hell. And God said, no, I don't want you to go there. I sent my son. He's the, he's the propitiation. He's the sacrifice. And God extends to us grace. And that grace is something we don't deserve. That grace is something that, that we shouldn't get. But God gives it to us anyways. But not only does he give it to us, look what else he wants from us. Look what else he desires from us. Because look what it says. Let, let us have grace whereby we may serve God. So, so hold on a minute. Let's, let's look at this. God gives you and I grace. We receive grace. We, we trust Christ as our Savior. We're, we no longer are on our way to hell. We have been given a greatest gift, and that's eternal life. And God gives us grace. Now what does God want us to do with that grace? He wants us to give it away. He wants to give it away. So how do you give away grace? You don't jump down everybody's throat for every small infraction they have. The guy that cuts you off, okay, praise the Lord. The guy that's doing things wrong or uh, uh, things that go out of your way and you, and you want to get angry, you want to get mad, you want to get violent, you want to get upset, okay. But what about grace? Is not the lost world doing what the lost world does? Is not the lost world acting ungodly, ungrateful, unholy, unreverent, unrespectable? Uh, is that not what the lost world is doing? And perhaps in that divine moment, what the Lord is looking for you to do is to extend grace. Look what he says. Look, 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 look. We, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and with what? Godly fear. So when you're giving that grace away, you're serving God with godliness. You're serving God with reverence. You're serving God with fear. 
But you know what happens when we don't give that grace away, when we don't give that unmerited favor away, when, when we allow our feelings to get hurt, when we allow our emotions to get hurt, when we, when we want something done a certain way, and all of a sudden it's not happening that way, and we're not willing to extend grace, what are we not doing? At that moment, we want it our way. At that moment, there's no reverence. At that moment, there's no fear. At that moment, there's no godly fear. At that moment, we're saying to God, God, I want it my way. Did Jesus ever say, I want it my way? Or did he say, I came to accomplish my heavenly Father's will? I came to do what he wanted me to do, and that's what I'm going to do. And he went all the way to the cross, doing what his heavenly Father wanted him to do. Extending grace to billions of people around the world for the last 2,000 years. What does God want for us once we've received that grace? To give that grace away. Why do we give that grace away? We give that grace away because the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians, go there with me, go there with me, 1 Corinthians, and I think this is a really good thing for us to, to constantly go back to and understand, 1 Corinthians chapter number 7, 1 Corinthians chapter number 7, verse 17, I'm going to go for sake of time, 1 Corinthians seven seventeen. but God hath distributed to every man as the Lord has called every one, so let him walk, and so ordain I in all churches. Is any man called being circumcised? Let him not be Come uncircumcised. Is any called uncircumcision? Let him not be circumcised. Circum circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, but the keeping of the commandment of God. Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. Are thou called being a servant? Care not for it, but be thou mayest be made free. Use it rather. For he that is called in the Lord being a servant is like a Lord's freeman. Now the word freeman... Uh, and if we were to look at it in the modern English, we would, we would separate it, and we would call it freed man. But it, here in the King James, the Old English, it says free men. So you understand that, that, look what it's saying. We'll finish the verse. We'll talk about that word for a second. Likewise, also he that is called being free is Christ's servant. So what, what the writer here is saying is, look, to the Jewish people, you no longer have to be under bondage. You now have Christ. You no longer have to partake in the Old Testament covenants of circumcision, or you don't have to be uncircumcised. That has nothing to do with your salvation in fact you have been made free but then he also goes on to say if you are still a servant meaning that you have you're a slave you're a master to somebody because that's how they believed back then and then if that's still the case it's okay because you've been made free in Christ but therefore if you are free in Christ and you don't have to and you don't have anybody that you're a servant to you are free then you should be a free man but a free man is going to serve God so he's saying, look, it doesn't matter if you're a servant slave and you have a master that you have to serve. You're not serving that master because you have to serve him. You want to serve them. You're serving your King Jesus. And by serving your King Jesus, you will work well for your master. But if you are free and you don't have a master that's over you and you don't, you're not a slave to anybody, you are still under the servitude of being like your savior. So what he's saying here is that you've been made free. I've been made free. Free from what? What's the thing we've been made free from? Free from our sin. If you have been born again, you don't have to go back and live in that sinful lifestyle. You've been free. Jesus opened the door and he said, I have paid the sin debt. You can walk and live a, a life on this earth free from sin because I paid that sin debt. But if you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, guess what? You're still in the bondage of sin. And so the author is saying, listen, you don't have to be in the bondage of sin under the law anymore, but also you don't have to be under the bondage of sin anymore you can be a free man. How do you get a free man? You say, Jesus, I'm a sinner and I'm tired of being a sinner and I repent of my sins and I believe you to be my savior. You say, how much faith does it take? It takes the faith of a mustard seed. How big is a mustard seed? It's about the size of a pencil tip. That's how big a mustard seed. But when it grows up, it's 20 to 30 feet tall, 20 to 30 feet wide, and it produces millions of more, sun, millions of more mustard seeds. That's the faith that you have to have. Listen, when we, when we came to faith, we didn't understand the propitiation of our sin. When we came to Jesus, we didn't understand the Holy Spirit was going to come and live and dwell inside of us and be our, our God-positioning system. We didn't understand the, the, the epistemological viewpoint of the Apostle Paul. We didn't understand any of these things. We went to God and said, Lord, I'm a sinner. I deserve hell. I don't want to go. And he saves us and makes us free, free indeed. I'm thankful for that. You should be thankful for that. We have that freedom, but because we have that freedom, what does God want us to do with it? He wants us to serve. Listen, our church is flourishing. Our church is growing. Our church is taking off. Why is it flourishing? Why is it taking off? It is because of God's goodness and his glory in that alone. When you lift up the book, 
When you lift up the book and you preach the book, you don't preach what this commentator says, you don't preach what that commentator says, you preach the book. You're lifting up Jesus. He says he is the Word, capital W-O-R-D. So when you preach the Word and you, you're preaching Jesus, the Word, Jesus, is changing hearts and changing lives. That's why our church is being blessed by God, because we preach the Word. Sure, we're like every other church. We probably have flaws. We probably could do things better. There's probably areas in our lives where we're lukewarm. There's probably areas in our lives where we're really hot and really cold. There's probably areas where we're lukewarm. Should we all have room to grow? We absolutely have room to grow. What's one of the best ways that we can have room to grow? Is by being a servant. Verse 23, he says, You are bought with a price. Be, be not ye then servants of men, brethren, let every man wherein he is called there and abide with Christ. And we know that going back to the, to the, to the Gospels, abiding in Christ, he is, the, he, is the, he is the tree and we are the branch and, and, and he is abiding in us and we're trying to grow out of him and do great and mighty things. And, and that's the way we should live our lives is abiding in Christ, living in Christ, doing the things God wants us to do. See, is it that simple? It's absolutely that simple. The book of Ephesians chapter number 6 the book of Ephesians, chapter number 6, verse number 6. Let's go back to verse number 5. Ephesians 6, 5. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters, according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and singleness of your heart as unto Christ. Then he says this, not with eye service, as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Listen, you understand that God wants every single one of us to serve him. Listen, if you have a boss, guess what? You should be the best employee that your boss has ever seen in the entire world. When your boss looks at you, they should say, wow, that woman is amazing. What's up with her? When he sees that guy, wow, that guy works, he works, he works. He takes his 15-minute break. He doesn't take a 17-minute break. He takes a 15-minute break. He's always working. He shows up on time, which means he's early. And when I need him to stay late, if he's able to, he stays late. Wow, what a great worker. That's the way it should be. Why? Because the boss is going to look at you and say, what's different about that person? What's different about that woman? What's different about that man? What's different about that teenager? What's different about the way that they do things? The difference is Jesus Christ. And then when you serve him, you're not serving him with just, oh, yeah, I'm going to serve God, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. But you serve him with what? With your heart. Serve him with your heart. Not with eye service. As men pleasers. But as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. If your heart's not in it, you're not going to do it. It doesn't matter what you do. If your heart is not in it, you're not going to do it to the best of your ability. It doesn't matter if you're a dishwasher. Be the best dishwasher in the entire world. It doesn't matter if you're a CEO. Be the best CEO in the entire world. It doesn't matter if you're a business owner. It doesn't matter if you work for someone. Be the best believer you possibly can be by doing everything that you do with all your heart. So that why? That your heavenly Father will be glorified. Look what it says in Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter number one, verse number one. Paul and Timothy, Paul and Timothy, yes, Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ, who they to serve, they're servants of Jesus Christ. So here they are, Paul, the apostle Paul, one of the greatest evangelists besides Jesus, and Timothy, his spiritual son, who he told to start churches and plant churches. What does he say? The servants of Jesus Christ. He doesn't talk about all, that he was highfalutin. He doesn't talk about how great he was. He doesn't talk about all the things that he's accomplished. He, that, that, he, he said it one time only because in defense that he was being attacked and, and using it for the furtherance of the gospel, but never in a boasting and bragging way. What do you say? Paul and Timothy is the, the servants of who? Who? Yeah, servants of Jesus Christ to all the saints in Christ Jesus. You know what that means? That if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're serving Jesus Christ, but while serving Jesus Christ, you're going to serve the people around you who are part of the body of Christ. That's our goal. That's our goal. You, you've heard the phrase, many hands made light work. Sure. We have things that need to be accomplished, things that need to be done. And imagine if you said, you know what, I can give an hour. I can give two. I can give four. And sometimes you say, I can't give an hour, or two or three or four. My, my life is so busy, but I can give X amount of dollars, or I can, I, can, I can donate this cause, or I can do this. What are you doing? You're, you're coming together saying, we can work. Paul and Timothy is the, the servants of Jesus Christ to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi within the bishops and the deacons. So what is he saying? 
that not only is he willing to serve, not only is he willing to train Timothy to be his spiritual son so he can pastor one day and maybe be an evangelist one day, not only is he going to minister to Jesus Christ, but the way he ministers to Jesus Christ is to the church. How are we ministering? Look what it says in Colossians, Colossians chapter number 3. Colossians chapter number 3, verse number 24. Colossians 3, 24. Knowing that, our, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. We know one day we're going to get an inheritance. We know one day that we, when, when we go to heaven, we're going to see something that we've never seen. We're going to see colors that our eyes cannot truly grasp. We're going to see and experience things that, that, that are too holy and too amazing and too beautiful that there is no place that we could ever go on this world that will even compare to how beautiful and amazing Christ is and how beautiful and amazing God is and how beautiful and amazing the Holy Spirit is and how beautiful and amazing heaven really is for all of eternity. How great that will be! Sometimes we just get lost in that wonder. We just lost and think about how good is it going to be? And you think about the best day, you think about the best food, you think about the most amazing things, and it has nothing compared to what heaven's going to be like. You're going to receive that. Why do you receive that? You receive that because you're a servant of Jesus Christ. But here's the truth. The more you serve Jesus Christ, and the more you sacrifice, and the more you give, and the more you lay down your life, the better your inheritance is going to be. And I think that's what a lot of us miss. A lot of us are so grateful that when we die, we're going to heaven, and we stop right there. Some of us go a little bit further, and then they get baptized, but then it stops right there. But other of us get it. We get it and say, you know what? I want more. I don't want more here because I can't take it with me. I want more there. I want to do everything I possibly can to give my life to Christ. Every area he asks me to give over, I want him to have it. You know what happens? We need to go to the closet sometimes and say, do you really want me to get that out of there, Lord? Do you really want me to get that out of there? Do you really want to talk about that? Do you really? Yes, he does. Listen, the Lord is looking for you to, to, to get right with him. Not just be okay. Not just be he's tolerating you, but to get right. What does it mean to get right? It means to make things right, to reconcile, to say, you know what? I may be at odds with God some way, shape, or form, and the biggest way you're at odds with God is if you don't know him as your Lord and Savior. If you're not on your, if you're not on your way to heaven when you die, you're going to die and go to hell. There's no, there's no way around it. There's no way to, to talk about it softly. There's no way to tiptoe around it. I'm not a milk toast preacher. You're not going to get a soft sermon. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, when you take your last breath, it could be five minutes from now, it could be five days, five weeks, five years, five months, whatever it is. If you take your last breath without Jesus Christ, you will die and go to the lake of fire, a literal place where there's, where there's no water, where there's eternal torment, where, there, where the worm dieth not. That's where you'll go. And there's no way somebody to pray you out. There's no way for somebody to buy you out. There's no way for somebody to get you out. You're there forever. What a sad thing. Because Jesus is extending a lifeline. And he's saying, I love you. I love you, and I know everything you're doing. And I still love you. I hate your sin. I hate what you're involved in. But I love you. And I want you to have eternal life but I'm never going to force myself on you. I'm going to wait until you're ready. But here's the thing. You don't know when you're going to take your last breath. So don't delay, because it could be today. You know that guy that was wheeling himself across the street in Worcester a couple months back in his wheelchair? Hit by a drunk driver, just died a couple days ago. He didn't think that was going to be his last day wheeling himself across the street. You know, drunk Tim that used to sit on the front church, front steps of the church, of the church with me, and I would talk to him and I'd say, drunk Tim, if you got sober, you could be my assistant pastor. And, oh, I'm serious. 
Drunk Tim, you need to give your life to Jesus. You don't know if one day you're going to leave the bar down the street, leave the liquor store, and you're going to walk down the sidewalk, and somebody's going to be drunk driving and hit you, and you're going to die. Oh, Pastor, that's not going to happen. Literally a year later, the exact thing happened. Walking down Lincoln Street, drunk driver came, took out three parking meters, hit Tim, spun him like a Frisbee, threw him into the side of the building, died. You don't know the day of the hour. You don't know when it's going to happen. But Jesus is right here and he's saying, I love you. I love you so much that despite you rejecting me all of these years, I forgive you and I still love you. And I'm waiting for you to get it. I'm waiting for you to say, you know what? I'm tired of playing games. I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to be the man that I need to be. I was talking to my wife a couple days ago, and she said, uh, my, my, my son said, I like your shirt, 1776. And my wife made the quick comment. She said, that's when America was born. And without missing a beat, I said, you know what America needs? America needs to be born again. America needs to be born again. What does that mean? That means we need to come back to Jesus. We need to go to Jesus and come to Jesus and give our lives to Jesus. Every shape, every form, every area, give our lives back to Jesus. No longer trusting big government to take care of us. No longer trusting the credit card to take care of us. No longer trusting the world to take care of us, but trusting King Jesus to take care of us. Listen, the churches across America need to be born again. The pulpits need to wake up and we need to see men on fire with a gospel in their heart burning once again. I read a article the article the other day. My wife sent it to me. It, it, was a, it was one of the prophets being sawn asunder. Sawn asunder in the picture of him upside down with a saw right at his midsection and they were sawing him in half. That's how he died because he preached the gospel. And we might get COVID, so let's close the church. Let's do Zoom and never go back. Let's raise the rainbow flag so everybody can be happy. Let's promote this cause because we want to be inclusive. No, we need to go back to the book and preach the book. Why? America is going down the tubes. We're circling the drain. We're circling the drain. Why? What is the reason? What's the major reason? Are you ready for it? We have forgotten to have the desire to be a willing servant. You see, when we serve, our kids will serve. Listen now, is the Bible true? You better believe it is. And the Bible says, train up a child. And when they're old, they will not depart from it. There may be some wild 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 year olds. They may be trying to figure life out in their hormones. And go, but if you train them, if you show them, if you teach them, if you say we're going to church for Sunday school, we're going to church for Sunday morning service, we're going to go in the fall when we start Sunday night service again, we're going to go to youth group, we're going to be there on Wednesday, when the church doors are open, we're going to be there. Why? Because we love Jesus. When you teach them that, there may be some years that they walk away. There may be some years that they hide. There may be years that they get afraid. There may be years that they get in trouble. But I'm going to tell you what, you know what they're going to remember? They're going to remember that you brought them to church. They're going to remember you taught them those Sunday school songs. They're going to remember you taught them those verses. They're going to remember you taught them those devotions. They're going to remember why. Because God will always bring his word back to fruition. Maybe, just maybe, like Brother Tyron was hitting that nail in the head. You want to see revival? It's not going to happen by you just doing. It's going to happen by you falling on your face and praying. Perhaps the reason why we're seeing what we're seeing right now is we've forgotten to pray. We've forgotten to get serious. We can go through the motions, we can check all the boxes, we can do this, we can do that, but when we forget to pray, we lose all power. Mark chapter number 10.
Mark 10, verse 42. But Jesus called to them, to him, called them to him, and said unto them, Ye know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it be not among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be the, shall be the servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. What, what, what does that mean? It means Jesus set the example the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the, 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 the greatest man that ever walked this earth. What was his major goal? To glorify his Heavenly Father. And how did he accomplish that? By being a servant. By being a servant. Being a servant means you stop doing what you desire to do and you start doing what God desires you to do. We live in a day and age where there are so many things battling for our attention. Send our kids to the wilds this past week, wild summer camp. And my daughter gets in the car, Cameron gets in the car, and she says, Dad, it was bad this year. So, you're at Bible camp, what's bad? It was bad, it was so bad that the director of the camp had to get up on Tuesday night and tell all the girls at Bible camp to stop wearing the short booty shorts that they brought to Bible camp. So you're at Bible camp. You're here with your Bible with no cell phones to get close to God and you're dressing like that. Now here's, here, here, here's the truth. Here's, here's, here's the honest truth. You can dress however you want. You can dress however you want. You know why you can dress however you want? You ready for this? Because you have free will. You have free will. However you want to dress, you can dress, but you have free will. But you have to realize that how you dress is an indication of what's going on in the heart. And when we dress certain ways, we're showing the world this is what's going on in my heart. And what we have lost, and we can jump over to 1 Timothy 2.9, I don't have time to go there, but you jump over to 1 Timothy 2.9, and, and you look at this verse, when it, and it's talking, the, the, the Apostle Paul is telling Timothy to preach the word in verse, verse 8, preach the word, be bold, be strong, preach the word. But in verse 9, he says to the women, he says, that you dress in modest apparel, and he uses this word, shame face, shame facedness. And what that means is that you should blush. You should, you should, what you wear, if it's revealing in any way, should cause your face to blush, and you should be upset about it. That's what he says. Now, I know there are some churches, like my church that I went to down in, in Connecticut, that's a, a legalistic church, that literally tells the women, if you're wearing a name brand, article of clothing, and it costs more than a certain amount, you're not living right. Then there's other churches that say, like this church we visited down in Hollywood, Florida. It's some Hollywood Baptist church, but I, I, I renamed it the Hollywood Bikini Baptist Church because all the women came in bikinis. And I realized why the church was packed because the men came to see the women in bikinis in church. So you have, you have two opposites. You have Bikini Baptist Church, which is not what you want to be, then you have legalistic Baptist church, which is not what you should want to be, because this gives you a list of rules. If you do do this, 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 you might be close to God. And this one says you can do whatever you want and still be close to God. And I think both are the extreme. But when you come to the truth, it says, if you're going to reverence and respect and love God, the way that you dress the, should reflect the heart, and what's going on in the heart is going to shine forth in how you act and how you speak and how you talk. It's no different from the lady who dresses a little immodest to the guy who comes up to me and starts dropping swears. Oh, I'm sorry, Pastor. I, I, I didn't mean it in front of you. 
There's, there's no difference. So let's not point just at the ladies. Let's, 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 or, or those jokes that are a little on the fringe edge. Those, those jokes that have the innuendos. It happens. It happens. You, it's going to be hard-pressed to serve God if you're in the legalism. Amen? It's going to be hard-pressed to serve God if you're over here in Bikini Baptist. It's going to be hard-pressed to be a servant if God doesn't have your heart. Because when he has your heart, he gets all of you. And when he gets all of you, all of you will desire to serve. All of you will change. All of you will be different. All of you will say, God, you know what? I don't want to live like the world anymore. I don't want to live in legalism. I don't want to live in Bikini Baptist. I want to live in the Word. I don't want to list, live with a, a, a list of rules of do's and don'ts. I don't want to li live in, in, in wild man's land. I want to live right here in the Bible, and I want your Word to change me every day. I think one takes the word to an extreme and the other one's probably not in the word. So what do you do? You find that balance. And what is the balance? God, I want to serve you. And here's what I know. My conviction might be different from my wife's conviction. But my wife's conviction might be different from Margaret's. Margaret's from Bob's. Because that's our conviction. But here's what I know. The more I serve him, the more I get close to him, the cleaner my life gets, the cleaner I want my family's life to get, the cleaner I want my kid's life to get, the cleaner I want my home to get. Why? Because I want to serve him. You know, there's going to be many people who are going to stand before God one day, and they're going to say, Lord, I did this, Lord, I did that. And God is going to say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, I never knew you. Why is he going to say that? He's going to say that because that person went through all the works that they did in the flesh, but they never gave their life to King Jesus. They never surrendered to say, Lord, I'll do whatever you want me to do. They never, they never turned their life around and say, God, I'm willing to serve you in whatever, whatever way, shape, or form you want me to do. And God will say, depart from me, work of iniquity. And the death angels will come and they will take you from the presence of God at that, at, that, at that throne judgment. And they will take you and cast you into the lake of fire where there will be eternal suffering and torment forever and ever and ever. Luke chapter number 10. Luke chapter number 10, verse number 30. And Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and, and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was on that, at that place, came and looked upon him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And went to him and bound him and pouring in his oil and wine and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And then the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence and gave it to them, the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou is thy neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, He that showed mercy on him, then, Jesus, then said Jesus unto them, Go and do thou likewise." You know, the problem that we have is we don't like to serve people who don't look like us. Oh, I'm going there. We don't like to serve people who don't look like us. We don't like to go across the aisle. We don't like to introduce ourselves. Look at our, stop and look around. Look around. No one looks like you. Praise God for that. <laughs> but we want to stick with our kind. What is our kind again? Our kind is a Christian. And there should be no divisions in this church. O only one amen from the back corner. There should be no divisions in this church. There should be a, unifi a, a unified church, a church that loves Jesus. It doesn't matter where you come from, where you go. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. It doesn't matter if you're black or white or Asian or, or Hispanic. It doesn't matter if you were born in America or weren't born in America. It doesn't matter if you live in a nice house or if you live in a crack house or if you live in a street. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, guess what? We have Christ in common. Praise God. So we should be willing to serve one another. 
But the truth is, is that if we're not willing to serve a stranger, we're not going to serve one another. But when we begin to serve one another, we will look and seek to serve strangers. We're willing to sacrifice our time, our talents, our energy to do what God wants us to do. Why? Because he loves us. And he set the example for us. And he did tell us to go and do likewise. So if God tells us to go do something likewise and we choose not to do it, we're not loving our neighbor as ourselves. And who is our neighbor? Our, our neighbor starts inside of our home. Our neighbor starts with our spouse. Our neighbor starts with our kids. Our neighbor starts at the next door neighbor. Who is your neighbor? Anybody that's not you is your neighbor. Galatians chapter number two, verse number two. Excuse me, Galatians chapter number six. Galatians chapter number six, verse number two. Bear you one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Verse number 10. As we therefore have opportunity, let us do good unto... There you go. Almond. That, that's not almond joy. Do good unto all men. Are you doing good? What does it mean to do good? It means when you have the opportunity, when you're looking for the opportunity, when you see the opportunity, do good to all men. Do good to everybody. As we therefore have the opportunity, let's do good unto all men, especially unto them who are what? Of the household of faith. So what do we do? We should look to be a blessing to other people in our church. So how do we look to be a blessing to other people in our church? We serve. We serve. Now I'm going to put somebody on the spotlight right here, and they're not going to like that I put them on the spotlight because they're a very introverted person, but I'm going to put them on the spotlight. Mark, back here, third or fourth row up, is a barber. Works five days a week. Has a good job. It's a trade. Makes a, a fair living. A good, honest job. Loves what he does. Has a heart to do it. And every Sunday, Mark comes to church. You know what Mark brings with him every Sunday when he comes to church? He brings his barber stuff. You know what Mark does? Mark looks around and says, hey, do you need a haircut today? Oh, yeah, I do need a haircut today. I got my stuff. Can I cut you? Sure. You know what that is? A servant. Taking something that they're good at taking something that they have a trade in and saying, can I minister to you? Now, maybe not good at cutting hair. You don't want me cutting your hair. You'll get one cut. Zero. Zzz. Everybody look like Pat in the back. Everybody like Pat's haircut? That's what everybody would get. Are you willing to serve? Serving doesn't always mean when someone comes to you, you serve. Serving means that you look for the opportunity to serve. When's the last time you went to a restaurant and went out back to where the serving line was, was like, hey, I need a server to come meet my table? No, they know to come to your table. They know to take your order. They know to bring you your drinks. They know to bring your appetizer. They know to bring you your food. They know to mess up your food, too, because they do it all the time. They, 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 they know to serve you. we should know to serve. This church has been built on servants. The greatest servant of all is King Jesus. I'm going to close with this. It's not my closing, but I'm going to close with this because I feel like the Lord's giving me an audible. The Apostle Peter. God says to the Apostle Peter, I'm going to use you in a great way. Follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. He followed him. You remember the story? Peter said, I'm never going to die you. And caught crows three times. He denies the Lord three times. And what does Peter do? After the, the death of Jesus, what does he do? He, he gets back in the boat. He goes fishing. And he takes all of his friends fishing again. And they toiled all night long. You remember the story? I mean, you remember the story? You remember the story? And Jesus sees them. And, and, he, and he hollers out to them. Hey, have you any fish? 
Now, when you go back and you study that in, in, in the original context, in the, in the original language, and you, and you realize Jesus wasn't being sarcastic. Jesus was asking a rhetorical question that he already knew the answer to. And most of the time, if Jesus ever asks you something, you better believe he already knows the answer. So he already knew the answer. And he says, have you any fish? Of course they didn't have any fish. They're toiling all night long. This is okay. Take the boat. Take the boat. Take the boat. Throw it on the other side. Take the fishing net and throw it on the other side. Take the boat. Throw it on the other side. That's another miracle Jesus has to do. So you take the net and throw it on the other side. And I, I can just picture him. He's scratching the head saying, Jesus, don't you know? We toiled all night long. We tried this. We tried that. We went here. We went there. We, it, there was no fish all around. So it, they take the net and almost begrudgingly, I can see it in my mind, taking the net and throw it on the other side. All of a sudden, what do they catch? The greatest catch of their lifetime. So full that the boat started to sink. What does Peter do? Peter's impulsive. I love Peter. I relate to Peter a lot. Peter used more of his zeal than he did of his brain. And God still used him. Amen, Mike? What does Peter do? Peter takes off his jacket, jumps in the water, naked, swims to shore. You know, the scripture leaves a little bit out. He jumps off the boat, naked, jumps into the water. He's got no clothes on. He gets to shore. And what, what does Jesus say? He said, I can't believe you did that, Peter. You filthy, dirty, rotten, no good sinner. Is that what he said? No. No. When Peter got to shore, there was a fire going, and there was fish. You know what that tells me? Because I know the end of the story. What that tells me is when we wander, And when we stray, because we do. There are times God tells us to do something and we walk away from him. There are times God has a commission on our lives. He's called us to do something. He's told us, he's commissioned us, he's sent us. There's times that he, that he tells us to do something and we forget. We turn our back. We say no. We go a different direction. We don't do what he wants us to do. Sound familiar? But what does God do? Before he tells us what to do again, he provides warmth, food, and fellowship. Have you walked away from being a servant? Have you walked away from God? And when I say walk away, I mean, are you more on fire today than when you first believed? Because truth be told, one of the greatest days we're ever going to see in our entire life is that day we're born again. And I think some of the times that we're born again happens when we're an adult, when we get to that, that we're no longer a teenage years and we understand life a little bit. We don't have it figured out. But we get to this place and we realize, you know what? I'm a sinner. And I deserve hell. And Jesus doesn't want me to go there. And he paid the penalty on the cross for me and I believed it. And I received it and I repented. And man, when that happens, whoo! Woo! You get excited. You start praising God. All your sins are washed away. You no longer have to be clean. You no longer have to be dirty. You can be clean. But then life creeps back in. And the devil comes a knocking, and friends come a knocking, and the TV and the world and the internet and all these things come a knocking. They start to encroaching your Christianity again. And then you're back on the boat. Fishing. But God said, I, I didn't call you to fish for fish. I called you to serve me, and by serving me, I want to make you fishers of men. And Peter forgot. Peter said, no. Peter went backwards. Pe Peter, Peter walked away. And I think perhaps one of the valuable lessons we need to learn here today is that you can be so close to Jesus for three years and in three days you can be back fishing. In 40 days, you can be fishing. 
in a short amount of time before he, from the death, burial, and resurrection till he ascended to heaven, there was backsliding Peter. Going back to what he was familiar with. Going back to what he was used to. Going back to the old lifestyle. But then you remember the end of the story? Jesus said three times, do you love me? Yes, Lord. And he says, feed my sheep. Do you love me? Yes, Lord. Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Yes, Lord. You know, thriving in pain. You know, just total turmoil inside. Then he says, feed my sheep. Well, it's interestingly enough that Jesus spent most of his ministry in a triangle between three distinct cities. He traveled in this triangle, and that's where he spent his ministry his whole life. Quite possibly, you can see the parallel when he says, feed my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. Maybe he's telling Peter, start a church here, start a church there, start a church there, but feed my sheep and love my sheep the way I love my sheep. And you know how we can love God's sheep the way that God loves his sheep? We can feed them. We can serve them. We can minister. Peter served God up until his death the death of a martyr. Peter laid down his life. Peter knew because Jesus told him he was going to be martyred and Peter didn't run away. Can you imagine that? I want you to think about that for a second. Imagine right now you have a conversation with Jesus. Imagine right now he comes down, he doesn't touch down the earth because if he did we'd all be raptured out of here. But imagine if he just came down and he hovered 10 feet above earth at a a pre-rapture rapture moment. And he said to you individually, you, I am going to allow you to be martyred for the cause of Christ. What would you say? Are you sure? Some of you would say, there's no way that's happening because I'm not even serving him now. Some of you would say, are you sure? And some of you would say, okay. Okay. I'm willing. Whatever it takes to advance your cause. Truth be told, I don't know if he's going to say that to any one of us. But we should be willing. And we should be ready. Why? If we don't see America born again, we will see America continue to circle the drain. And we will see the book of Revelation And we will see the prophets played out before our eyes. And we will say, what happened? And the thing that happened was that this generation didn't serve like 120 years ago when they served. This is not a shaming message. This is an encouraging message. Encouraging how? It's time to step up. It's time to stop playing games with your Christianity. It's time to stop running back to the old lifestyle. It's time to stop getting your answers from the television. And it's time to start getting the answers from the book. It's time to fall on your face and fall in love with God like you haven't fallen in love with him in a long time, if ever. Why? We've got to redeem the time. I'm thankful that we have the illustration of Peter. I'm thankful he walked away and God put that in the book. But I'm thankful that God said to him, do you love my sheep? And he said yes three times and then God said, okay, I'm going to let you know you're going to be martyred. And that didn't deter him. Maybe that made him bolder and he gave his life finally, completely to Jesus Christ. Where are you at this morning? Are you teeter-tottering on life? Is your Christianity back and forth? Are you constantly on the boat doing what you, you've been called away from? Or are you constantly in the center of where God wants you? Are you on fire for Jesus Christ? Or are you hot? Are you cold? Are you lukewarm? Where are you at? Where are you at? I can tell you this. Nobody likes being lukewarm. Nobody wants to be in that spot. What does God want from you? God wants you to be on fire. And maybe your personality isn't woo like my personality. But that doesn't mean you can't be on fire. Because you know what? There's people who are introverted. 
There are people who are brilliant in their mind and could be on fire and set the world ablaze for God in ways that I couldn't even dream of. What are you doing? Are you serving? Are you serving yourself? Or are you serving King Jesus? Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, you alone are worthy to be praised. You alone set the example, the prime example of what life is all about. You came here, you were the paramount of any one of us. You, you showed us how we could live, how we could walk, how we could talk. In the book of Deuteronomy, it says, if we love you, then we're going to serve you. If we love you, we're going to give you our heart. If we love you, we're going to walk after you. If we love you, we will fear and reverence you because you are our God. It says, thy God, you are our God. We talk about you all the time. We, we praise your name. We, we say how good you are. But like Brother Tyron said in Sunday school, there are times that we are not getting our, our prayers answered because we are not asking correctly to God. We're not pouring our heart out to God. Perhaps we don't see the things in this world that we want to see because we're not living the successful, cont contagious, on fire Christian life. But if you're here right now, God wants that to be changed. God wants you to be different. God wants you to turn your back to the world and to step out by faith and give your life to Jesus Christ. Perhaps you've been thinking about it. Perhaps you've been mulling it over. Perhaps you're wondering what happens if I'm at my work and something bad happens. Perhaps you're in a, in a, in a bad environment. Perhaps you work with machines. Perhaps you work with people. Perhaps you, you work in the wilderness. No man knows the day nor the hour, but I know this. If you're on a roof, they have a safety harness. If you're a lifeguard, there's a safety vessel, there's a life vest. If you're a, a, a fireman, there's, there's a safety apparatus. If you're a police officer, there's a bulletproof vest. There's all kinds of safety in this world to prevent you from dying. But the one safety thing that this world really needs is King Jesus. And there's one thing right now that people need is we need to accept Christ as our Lord and Savior. And if you're here today and you've already given your life to Jesus Christ, praise the Lord. The Lord wants you to step up and he wants you to serve him with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind. But if you're here today and say, Pastor, I've never given my life to Jesus, but I've been thinking about it. I've been thinking about this God thing. I've been thinking about this Jesus thing. I got something going on in my mind and I just don't know. I just don't understand, but I want to give my life to Jesus. All you got to do is believe. All you got to do is by faith, call upon his name. His name is King Jesus. His name is Jesus Christ. His name is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. So how do I call upon him? Call upon him in the name. Dear Jesus, I've been fighting you for a long time. I've been running for a long time. God, I know you've been knocking on my heart. I've been thinking about you a lot, and I don't know why. But Jesus, today I want to give you my life. I don't understand everything this means. But I don't want to run anymore. Jesus, I repent of my sins. I repent of all those things I did when I was a child. I repent of all those things I'm involved in right now. God, I don't, I don't understand this whole Jesus thing, but I'm going to place my faith in you, in you alone. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for paying my penalty on the cross. I now give you my life. In Jesus' name I pray. With every head bowed, and every eye closed. Is there anyone that would say to me, to God, today, Pastor, I just prayed that prayer and I gave my life to Jesus. Would you simply just raise your hands? That's me. I gave my life to Jesus. How many say, Pastor, I know God wants me to serve more. I know He wants me to step up by faith more. I know He wants me to live for Him more. I know he wants me to walk after him more. If that's you, as this music plays, why don't you come down to this old-fashioned altar and spend some time with God. Maybe husbands, bring your wives and say, I want to serve God more. Maybe dad, mom, bring your kids and say, I want to serve God more with you. 
maybe friends of relatives who are lost, you come forward and say, I want to pray for my lost family, my lost friends. But I want to serve God. I don't want to play games anymore. I want to give it my all. I want to be on fire like I've never been on fire before. I want to run towards God like I've never run towards Him before in my life. I want to redeem my life right now for the cause of Jesus. He is my Lord. He is my Savior. He is the one, the true, the only God. And I want to serve Him. pray. Lord, your word says in Psalm 28, 9, save the people and bless thine inheritance. Feed them also and lift them up forever. God, as long as you should tarry, as long as you should delay from coming back to this world and taking us home, God, I pray that you'd bless us. I pray, God, that we would lift your name up today, tomorrow, and every other day that the name of Jesus will be magnified and glorified. Thank you for all that you do. God, we love you, we thank you. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. Mike, Christine, can you guys come up here real quick? As many of you know, Mike and Christine are moving to Florida. Uh, we are thankful for Mike's service here in the city as a uh, Worcester police officer for uh, many years now. And we're thankful for him, we're thankful for Christine and, uh, and little Peter coming here today. But we just want to pray over you. May the Lord bless your journey down south. Um, hopefully you don't like the weather and you come back. Gracious Father, thank you for my Christine and Peter. God, I pray that you bless their journey, help them find another good church that they can get into, allow Peter to grow up in the love and admonition of the Lord, protect Mike as he's taking another police officer position. I pray, God, you put your loving arms around him, protect him, guide him, and allow him to be the man of God that you desire him to be. Thank you for Christine and her love for you and love for her family and love for her child. I pray, God, you bless them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. John wants to do something. Well, Pastor and Rachel, we know that your wedding anniversary is next Saturday, so today we would like to 
highlight, recognize, and honor you guys and celebrate your 17th wedding anniversary. We just want to say we praise God for you guys. Thank you for your faithfulness to each other, the godly example that you guys are to us as a church family. And we would just like to try to be a blessing to you and love on you guys. And we have a couple of things for you guys. The nation is going to help out if you can start bringing something over here for you guys. But we just want to say we love you and happy anniversary. Pastor and Rachel, we love you. Adam Square Baptist Church family. We just want to say thank you. And we love you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Oh, nice. Yeah, it's for her. Yeah. Yeah, I, kn I knew that wasn't for me. No, well, speech, speech, speech. Hey, uh, I'm thankful. Uh, you know, uh, I know this is going to be no surprise to any of you, uh, but over the last, what, 17 years now, uh, there's been many people who have come to my wife and said, there is no other person on the face of the earth that could ever be married to him. How do you do it? Uh, and, you know, over the last 17 years, I kind of agree with them. Uh, and so I'm thankful for you, Rachel. I'm thankful for all that you do. As I tell uh, people a lot, uh, my wife is the one who plays the music in the background, meaning she's the one kind of moving things and making sure they go the way they need to go, and I get to get up here and quote-unquote look good. Uh, and so I'm thankful for everything you do, not only here in church, but also in our home. I love you. Happy anniversary. Let's sing one. We'll, sing, we'll sing one song, first verse. One song, one verse. All right, going to sing the first verse of hymn number 343, Springs of Living Water, 343. First verse. I thirsted in the barren land of sin and shame, and nothing satisfying there I found. But to the blessed cross of Christ one day I came, where springs of living water did abound. Drinking at the springs of living water, happy now am I, my soul they satisfy. Drinking at the springs of living water, oh, wonderful and bountiful supply. Amen, have a blessed day, church.